So welcome. I'm so excited today to have Devin Ibanez, um, who is one of the world's first openly gay um, professional rugby player here with me today to chat. We have a lot of things to discuss. Um, I'm really excited for you all to join us and for you all to get to know him a little bit better. Yeah, so, so, so grateful to have you here. And I'd love for you if you um, would like to share a little bit about yourself, especially for folks who maybe are getting to know you for the first time, just to share a little bit about um, uh, who you are and also how you got to this point, you know, where so many people are reaching out wanting to talk with <laughs> you and hear more about your story. Sure. Um, so I have been playing rugby for 12 years. So I'm 27 now. I picked up rugby when I was about 15 years old. And I've traveled all over the world. I've played in Australia, I've played in New Zealand, I've played in England and Israel and Canada and I've, I've been <laughs> I've been to a lot of different places and doing this thing for a long time. Um, I've captained a few different teams like my high school and my university team and I recently in 2019 signed a contract and as you mentioned became the first openly gay professional player in the US um, which was a massive accomplishment and in doing so I also kind of came out publicly in the rugby community and revealed my boyfriend as well, who's been my partner for the last three years. Um, and we've currently been kind of separated by the pandemic for the last year. Right. And we've actually been in a long distance relationship for the last two years because I'm based in Boston and he's based in the UK. So that was one of the big things that kind of led to me coming out. But that's, uh, that's why I'm here. That's why people are <laughs> talking to me is, <laughs> is I made that post and it just kind of blew up and got picked up by a bunch of media outlets around the world. And it's been a crazy few months ever since. It's actually been like three months now, which yeah. is crazy to think about. Congratulations on your three month anniversary, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, wow. yeah, it's just like I blinked and three months were gone. I mean, it's just been so busy every single day, kind of trying to stay engaged with different projects and like trying to find ways to sort of use this new platform that I have. And so it's been, it's been an adjustment for sure, but it's really exciting. Yeah, definitely. And it's so great to see that a lot of people have been really inspired by your story and also been wanting to share it and have, you know, been really seeing this as like a, yeah, a, definitely a big breakthrough, right, in this um, field of sports. And also, you know, just hearing about some of the work that you've been doing, I've just been really inspired by the way that you're really championing for inclusivity within sports. And you're also using your own story as a platform, right, to like really let other people see another person who's made a, a choice that sometimes can be a really scary choice right to um, come out um, especially within sports yeah and I think within rugby as well it's got such a reputation for being like this intense kind of like manly man kind of a sport where it's seen as a very like kind of straight men only kind of a culture so I think that I really felt like it was important to do this because I just kind of looked around after playing in all these different countries and realized I never really met another LGBTQ rugby player playing a high level and being outspoken and advocating for LGBTQ people in sports. So I realized that there was a space that I could kind of step into and hopefully, you know, do something meaningful that would hopefully create some sort of positive change would be the ultimate goal. <laughs> In one way, I can really relate to this as someone who also um, wished I could have seen more people like myself growing up, right? Um, I think that's something that is so challenging when you, um, you know, I think we all need to see people who look like us, who, who are like us, and to get inspired and to also feel like we have a right, you know, to exist in the world. I think that's like yeah. a... I think that's so huge and to be able to be that for other people is also really powerful. Um, I, I definitely know that myself um, having, you know, a lot of people reach out to me wanting to know about like artwork or about how I got into the different professions that I'm in and just thinking of like, yeah, there haven't been a lot of, you know, queer Latinx people within certain spaces. And so to, um, yeah, to have that is so special. And I'm sure you're already getting people reaching out to you who are being inspired by your story. Yeah, and it's been it's been amazing just to be able to connect with all those different like LGBTQ athletes because I, like I said, I didn't really meet them within rugby, and I kind of like pigeonholed myself into this rugby culture, so I didn't really meet other LGBTQ athletes very often. So it's been crazy to just be able to like 
talk to them and hear about their stories and find the ways that you know we share these similar experiences and in what ways our experience also are very different and the things that we've kind of gone through because I think that I also have a very different experience than a lot of kind of gay men specifically who go into playing sports in the sense that I was not somebody who was you know very actively perceived as being gay I wasn't somebody who a lot of people would be you know, assuming that about me. So I think right. that in a lot of ways, I didn't have to go through a lot of the things that other people have experienced. Mm, right. So it's been kind of like a interesting to find out that even though we're both gay in a sport where we're surrounded by people who are not like that, just the drasticness and how different those experiences can be, even though we are in theory going through something very similar. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's such a great thing to point out that, you know, we all have different experiences based based on like how much we conform to certain like gender stereotypes right and just uh based on yeah. how much we're able to quote unquote pass right like those are all yeah. things that give us certain privileges that other people don't have and i think you know i have been really appreciative of seeing how you're really championing for trans inclusivity within sports especially as as you're saying someone who um you know, passes and like in some ways it has those like kind of cis passing privileges or whatever, yeah. right? And really working with that. And I definitely know myself as a non-binary person who also people assume is, um, you know, male. I definitely use my own um, male assumed privileges, right? <laughs> that people uh, put onto me. Um, yeah, and I'd love to hear, you know, I think you, you named some of the, you know, the different journeys. I know um, one of the things that I'd love to speak with you about is just uh, mental health and coming out. Because I know for myself, like when I first came out, it was a really big decision. I, I was 19 when I first came out. And a big reason why I came out was I had a really good friend who was in the closet. And we were both kind of in the closet together. Mm -hmm. And... I really saw like how much he was struggling because, um, you know, for him at the time, he was pretty like, I would say gender nonconforming and like people were already like assuming that he was queer. Yeah. Um, and in a way like myself, I think people maybe had questions and doubts, but it wasn't. Um, I would say like I'm kind of able to pass and mutate in a way. Um, <laughs> and yeah so you know but at the time where you know he told me like i'm never gonna come out i'm not gonna ever like you know be public and i just remember thinking to myself that i was already starting to feel a lot of anxiety a lot of fear um and i just like kind of had a moment where i was like i don't want to live with that i want to be able to actually be myself and live a life that feels authentic to me and definitely not an easy choice right and it's no. and it's had its consequences and um in both you know really positive ways and also definitely painful ways too so uh, but i also never um i don't regret doing it because it's really transformed my life it's really allowed me to be more um, authentic be myself and um has also really brought the right people into my life as well so i'd love to hear about your journey and yeah what it was like for you to come out and if you want to share a little bit about mental health yeah, absolutely. But before I get into that, what was what was that like for you? Like, what was your family like? Like, what was your kind of background growing up? Because I, I don't know very much, you know, about you. Like, did you have much support when you were at that age? Like, what was it like? Yeah, thank you for asking that, Devin. Um, so, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up in a small town in Southern California. Um, and I grew up in a pretty, like, um, I would say, like, immigrant community. And so it was mostly Spanish-speaking. Um, and I also grew up, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and I also grew up Jehovah's Witness. So you kind of compound okay. that on top. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, growing up in a Christian community, growing up in an immigrant community, those definitely, I would say, I didn't see any examples of openly queer people, my, you know, growing yeah. up. Um, and it was definitely a challenge for my parents. Um, and the way I came out was interesting. I um, had a, an honors thesis at my university that was studying perception of queer and gender non-conforming people. And then at some point, my um, advisor was like, oh, you have to invite your parents now so they could see what you've been working on all year. <laughs> and it was that moment that it hit me like, oh, shit I have to come out to my parents or I have to tell them that I'm like really interested in queer research you know yeah. and that was how I did I invited them and told them what I was doing and you know my the only conversation we really had about it was my mom was like this is for school right <laughs> like, and I was like yes and it's also something I'm interested in personally you know and yeah, so it was it was definitely I would say about a year where you know we 
we didn't really speak about it. Um, mm-hmm. And my parents have, were never like negative or like mean about it, but they also were. I could definitely sense some disapproval or sadness. So did you did you come out as gender nonconforming or just like queer in general? Like, what did you come out to them? Like, what do they know? What did they know you as at that age? Yeah, I came out as queer at the time, um, and I, you know, I think they assumed I was gay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, I, I would say, like a few years later, I had an interesting moment. Um, I was dating uh, a cis woman for a mm-hmm. moment um, in Portland, and uh, she came to visit my family, mm-hmm. and my family was like really confused, but they were also like really happy, and were like, "Oh my God, Edgar came over oh. to the right side," you know. <laughs> and that was awkward. Um, yeah. <laughs> As you could imagine. Um, yeah, but I think I, at that time, my mom did ask me, like, I thought you liked men. And I was like, you know, I am I like ev- everyone. I, I'm pretty, like, expansive in terms of who I'm attracted to. Um, yeah. And then it wasn't until years later that I've, like, kind of started to tell them that I'm non-binary. But I also, mm-hmm. like, haven't really had that conversation with them that directly. Um, especially because I feel like, you know... I've definitely been transforming a lot in my life. And I think in a sense, like they already accept a certain part of me and I'm just like, you know, <laughs> like that's... Yeah, let's, let's take it step by step. <laughs> yeah. That's always, it's always really interesting to me. I mean, cause since I, I come from a Puerto Rican background and I think it's always interesting with that kind of like, you know, Hispanic culture where it's like so celebrated in its flamboyancy, you know what I mean? Where it's all about the outfits and the colors and, you know, the dancing and, then when you bring the kind of queerness or being gay into it, it's like, oh, well, no, we, we don't celebrate it in that way. And it's like this very <laughs> weird kind of like wall that's put up where it's like you can be flamboyant, but you can't cross over into this type of, you know, lifestyle, quote unquote. Right. Yeah. And did you see that, I guess, like for yourself growing up, was that something that you felt like affected you or made you think about like how you could present? So I so I come from a mixed household. So like my my father is has a Puerto Rican um, mother who raised him pretty much, you know, by herself from when she was 16 years old, like very much that strong four foot nine Puerto Rican grandmother who, <laughs> who doesn't, doesn't take shit from anybody. Right. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> Big very presence. That. Yeah, it's very, very that. And so that's kind of the background he comes from, of you know, being um, poor growing up in Spanish Harlem in New York, being raised by this, you know, single mother who didn't get to finish high school because she's raising kids by herself and my mother came from a little bit more of a middle class kind of background she grew up in Long Island and has two Jewish parents and so that's kind of the two backgrounds I've got like this sort of European Jewish kind of background mixed with this kind of Hispanic American eyes kind of background so they're both very liberal like they were the hippies in the 1960s like very much not about just society's norms in a lot of ways. So I think that I was raised Unitarian Universalist. Um, Mm. I don't know how much you know about Unitarian Universalism, but I mean, a lot of it is about embracing diversity and about, you know, no view is necessarily more valid than another view. It's more about this idea of community and celebrating each other. So that was kind of the environment that I just always grew up in. I never really felt pressure from my parents in that kind of sense about being you know you have to be this certain way or if you're going to be a man you need to act in this way or if you know if you're going to be our son you need to be with a woman and give us grandkids like it was never it was never that and one of my earliest memories even from my parents when I was you know four years old is they would just take me aside and they would tell me you know just so you know no matter who you love as long as you're happy like we love you we want you to be happy and I'm there and I'm like four years old and I'm like cool like, like what does whatever that mean? yeah whatever yeah. that means to you okay exactly but then it's like you know you start having those feelings later and then you know like oh well that's not something I have to worry about my parents have made it very clear that mm. I'll have all that love and I'll have all that support regardless of what happens so I grew up in a very like accepting household and one that I'm very grateful for and it didn't just extend to my sexuality and being comfortable sharing it with them it also kind of extended to like what you're saying like those expectations of what a man should be, you know, or what I needed to be to be seen as a, you know, man, quote unquote. I didn't get a lot of those traditional Hispanic, Latino background kind of hangups of 
what masculinity is because right. my father was always very the opposite. I mean, he grew up with his mom and his father, you know, wasn't in the picture. He doesn't have good memories of his father. I've never met his father and I never will meet his father. And for him, his mother was his big influence in his life. And he kind of just grew up, you know, being in touch with his emotions as he got older and older and not being ashamed of that. And, you know, by the time he had me with my mother, he was very much a person who was working through the trauma of his childhood and not afraid to show his emotions and the struggles that he had gone through and, you know, would be perfectly upfront saying that, you know, it's okay to cry and it's, right. it doesn't make you less to be crying. And I have memories of my father, you know, sobbing when I was growing up and it was just never something that was strange to me because he always kind of showed me that example of you are not less of a person you are not less of a man if you display your emotions and in fact they would often tell me it was the opposite that it was very healthy and that I should express myself in that way mm. I'm so glad that you've been able to receive that and also can internalize that you know yeah. and yeah because I think not a lot of people get that growing up you know that both the message of like whoever you love you're okay right and then also the message of you know as no matter how you show up you're also okay you know <laughs> like yeah. i think those are really important messages that i think a lot of us could have used more growing up and um and at the same time you know i think we're both here to say that as adults too right that you know whoever's watching this right now you're you're okay however you show up and you are okay <laughs> regardless of who you love also Absolutely. And I mean, that kind of support is what, you know, not only gave me the confidence to be myself and do what I did, you know, this year, but, you know, I came out to my parents when I was 12 years old. And at the time I came out as, you know, bisexual. Um, but, you know, they always sort of knew that I was somewhere on that, you know, spectrum of sexuality, of being queer. And right. it was just something that I was never never worried about with them and you know when I came out to my mom I think you know the only uh she'll get a she gets a b plus on the scorecard just because she told, <laughs> me, she told me that uh she was like oh you know it's okay like you're 12 like it's probably just like a phase so it was like it was like supportive because she didn't want me to like almost like pigeonhole myself in to be like I'm gonna be this way forever I guess I think is probably the way she was approaching it from right and because I was so young I think she was kind of like caught off guard right. so other than that not great sort of sound bite. <laughs> she's been she's been incredibly supportive the whole time. Yeah, and and that's a good reminder that like sometimes people might want to offer support and might do it in a way that could be slightly off, you know, yeah. and, and to have um, compassion for people and knowing, because that's something that I've really sat with with my own parents. I know for myself, it took me a long time to feel okay with being queer. And it yeah. took me a long time to even like, accept it and make it known to myself so i definitely i think um had to remind myself like it's taken me so long to be okay with this like i know you know for someone who's first coming into this knowledge like it might take them a moment to you know yeah. be okay with it or to process it well then it's also the other interesting aspect which is you know i mentioned i came out at 12 and i didn't have these you know i didn't get negative feedback from my family or have this concern of you know, losing home or losing, you know, my safety. And even from that, of knowing that from when I was 12 years old, it still took me another, you know, whatever it was, 16 years to bridge right. the gap of saying, oh, I am openly gay in a space where I am usually the most comfortable, which is when I'm expressing myself as a rugby player and I'm playing in that way. But I still couldn't bridge that gap. So I think it's just so complex where it's not just about, oh, well, I'm happy with it. It's also now being at a point where, I'm happy enough with it and comfortable enough with myself that I'm not going to be concerned about other people's perceptions. Like there is still such a gap to be bridged between being happy with yourself and being happy with yourself when faced with the scrutiny of other people and being willing to kind of put yourself out there in that way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And would you mind sharing a little bit more about that? Like, you know, especially as you're saying, coming from a, a home where you were accepted, you were able to yeah. be open. I'm imagining you're open with maybe other friends and, you know, people yeah. in your in your life. And then to enter into a place where, um, did you feel like you had to go back in the closet or were you still kind of open with some people? So when I was 12, I was going to an alternative school. So I actually, when I was a kid, I let's for lack of better words i wasn't a great kid um i i got into a lot of trouble in school like every single year from when i was in kindergarten to when i was in fifth grade i got suspended <laughs> every single year suspended 
sometimes multiple times for something i could tell you one specific story was <laughs> was when i was in kindergarten one of the reasons i got suspended was we were playing a game of kickball and one of my friends kind of egged me on and i decided it would be a good idea if i mooned the class oh um, my and gosh. I, I, got, um, I got picked up from uh, school by my mom that day um she wasn't too happy but it was it was a lot of like that like i just i would act out i had all this energy and so that's why i ended up going to an alternative school is because the public school just kind of got to the point where they're like, well, we don't really, like, he's got a lot of energy and we don't really know what to do with him, so you guys should put him on ADHD medication. And my parents are both lifetime educators, you know, 20 plus years in the public school system, and they're like, we don't really feel comfortable putting our 12-year-old kid on that kind of medication. Like, he's just got a lot of energy because he's a 12-year-old kid, like, right? Like, right. he wants to be outside. He doesn't want to be sitting in a desk for, you know, eight hours out of the day, so... I think that going to that school was kind of what gave me a bit of space and time to kind of understand myself better and kind of work on relating to people in a different way other than just like acting out and being silly. So I spent three years at that school and that's when I came out was during my time at that school. I was there from ages, I think like 11 to 13. and. When I was 12, I met somebody who was a bit older than me. He was, I think, 15, maybe 16 at the time. Um, his name's Tommy Solo. He's actually gone on to do a lot of um, great work. He's a designer, and he designed shoes for, you know, like Lady Gaga and Ariana Grande, like all the, all the big names. But at the time, he was the only openly gay person that I knew. And we ended up becoming friends. He kind of took me under his wing. I think he probably sensed that <laughs> I might have been grappling with some of the same feelings at some point that he was. And... That was the first person who kind of where I knew that about myself, right? Where mm -hmm. I'm talking to somebody who's having right. these similar experiences, having these similar thoughts. So after I left that school when I was 13, I started back in the public schools, which was public high school. And that's when I started, you know, my first experience was I went to go play American football. And when I went to play American football, I was this kind of weird kid who was coming from an alternative school and didn't really have friends on the team and was kind of quiet and kept to himself. And I would get bullied every day. Like, you know, I would have, there was one particular guy on the team who would take me aside and, you know, he would call me a faggot every day and he would, you know, be in classes with me, sitting behind me, doing the same thing. And that was really difficult for me. I mean, obviously I kind of went into my shell. There wasn't anybody kind of sticking up for me at that time and even though I was in a place that was very accepting in a lot of ways like Brookline Massachusetts is where I'm from and it's like way up in the northeast United States in Massachusetts which is obviously a state that is known for being pretty progressive in a lot of ways um, it was still something that I kind of had to deal with and it was one of those things where I wasn't being called that because they assumed I was gay I was more being called that just because it was something that was so prevalent that you know kids that age are doing is just like that's the way that we bring each other down right. so I think that's sort of what I struggled with when I was getting into sports was that kind of language is still really prevalent and I just sort of took it as well you know I know this about myself but you don't necessarily share every detail about yourself with everybody you meet right so I just sort of compartmentalized it and convinced myself like you know, it's not a completely relevant detail. It's a detail about myself that I can share with people if I want to and I'm comfortable with them. But in terms of expressing it openly in kind of a sports space where I don't really know how to gauge people, right? Like people are okay using those that kind of language. So like, what are they going to say behind my back or to my face even if I come out? I don't know if I necessarily felt that kind of oppressed necessarily at that age I think that I had really convinced myself that it just wasn't that necessary of a detail and I felt like I was like well you can still be yourself without sharing that one detail with everybody right and I think that that's kind of a place where a lot of queer people get is mm -hmm. you're just sort of like well I can still be happy with myself and not share that with every single person that I come in contact with but then I think as I continued to go through life and you start kind of seeing like how important it can be, right? When you start finally having a relationship and that person is now a central part of your life. And, you know, if your teammates ask you, well, what did you do this weekend? And I went and I was away with my partner the whole weekend and I've got to be like, oh, well, you know, I went to Maine with a friend or, you know, I just, I went on a road trip by myself. And it's like, why can't I just share what I actually did and share that part of my life? So it does start to become 
a lot more restrictive. And I think that that's what I was starting to grapple with and why it came out later in life is because that's when I really started to feel restricted by it and getting to the point where I'm like, well, what is holding me back, right? Like, I know I have a supportive family. I know that I'm happy with myself. What's stopping me from kind of taking that step? Yeah. And, you know, you bring up multiple things. And, you know, one of the questions that I received on my Instagram was from someone who wanted to ask a little bit of advice if they were, you know, wanting to come out of the closet. And I think one of the things you named is that there are sometimes environments where it's really protective to kind of hide parts of yourself right or to not really share as much of yourself and and then you know that there could be moments where that protection doesn't make sense anymore you know and you can kind of look around and you're like oh wow i don't have to be that afraid anymore so i'd love you know with this question in mind if if there's anything you feel like you would like to share to someone who might still be in the closet who you know is struggling with that yeah i would love to do that i think that when i get this question it's always something that i feel is necessary to kind of do a bit of a disclaimer of as you mentioned like there's such a vast difference in like how supportive the environment you're in are so it'd it'd be easy for me to say like you know just go for it and make (laughs) the leap and be yourself but then it's like you've got countries where you could get the death penalty for that or you might lose all of your housing or any chance of employment and so i try to give it in the best general way i can which is for me something that was really important was taking the time to build a really strong support system, right? Like finding those people along the way who you know are supportive and you know who are always gonna have your back and taking the time to confide in those people because I think that in my experience, when I took the time to do that, those people felt a lot closer to me. And in a lot of times Mm. I felt a lot closer to them because they felt like I not only trusted them with something like this, but that I felt comfortable sharing a part of myself with them and that vulnerability kind of opened up for them to be able to feel vulnerable with me. And I think right. that that, especially as, you know, people who are in a very traditional kind of masculine culture, that's something that's very rare. And I think a lot of, you'll be surprised, but I think a lot of cis men actually really appreciate that vulnerability because it's not kind of something that they get very often. They don't sort of get that signaling of, it is okay if you share these kind of vulnerable parts of mm-hmm. yourself with me. Mm. Um, so I've always found that really rewarding of the few teammates who I did kind of tell along the way. A lot of them I was already very close to, but after telling them, it was like very much cemented that these people are my best friends and Mm. I know that they'll be there for me and I know that they'll try to find ways to make me comfortable. Um, but then the second piece of advice I would give once you've really taken that time, like I said, there's no rush, there's no time that you have to come out I came out when I was 12 but I also came out publicly when I was 27 like there's no (laughs) you also don't have to come out at all like there's no rule that says you have to share that with people about yourself but I think that for me as somebody who was in the closet for so long at least in that kind of athletic space you really spend a lot of time focusing on the negative outcomes that could happen and the kind of backlash that you could receive. And I know that for me, I spent so much time focusing on, well, I might lose opportunities to play at this level if I do this, or I might be viewed as a token if I were to come out in this way, or I might be seen as somebody grabbing attention. You go through all these worst case scenarios in your mind. I think that for me, I wish I had just spent more time thinking about the positive possible positive impact that it could have and the possible like love and kind of joy that not only you'll spread but you'll receive I think that's something that you know there were times where I thought like yeah if I were to come out this might be something that would hopefully inspire other people or you know be meaningful in some way but I definitely didn't ever take time to think of you know coming out having all these people reach out to you and even people who don't identify as LGBTQ plus take you aside and say I think what you're doing is really important and we don't have enough people who are speaking up in this space in that way right now I think that if I'd spent more time focusing on that positivity I would have felt a lot more confident doing it sooner and even just Mm. better for my mental health of not just living in that possible negativity kind of space not living in this constant worry of what's the worst thing that might happen I think it's important to assess the risks, obviously, but I think that also give yourself time to think of the unexpected love and the possible, you know, fantasy where things work out better than you expected. I think that it's important to kind of give yourself that positive visualization. Right. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you bring up so many things I think could are really important to name. I think one of the things that I really appreciate you sharing is that, um, 
you know, there, there are a lot of people out there, you know, cis men included, as you name, who want to be vulnerable, right? Yeah. Who want to open or take down those walls and connect and, and, you know, the fear that, the real fear that exists there and also the possibility that exists there. I think that those are two things that you really name that are important that they, you know, as scary as it is to come out, as scary as it is to share something vulnerable, those are the things that sometimes, yeah, do bring you closer to, to yourself and also closer to other people and also closer to maybe what's wanting to happen in your life, right? Because um, I think that's also something that I've experienced. Um, and, you know, you bring up like mental health and you bring up also visualization is I've had so many stories for myself um, around like things I should or shouldn't do or can or can't do. And, you know, I definitely assess the risks, as you're saying, yeah. um, and also know that sometimes I'm going to do something and it's going to fail and I'm going to fall flat on my face. And, you know, those have been moments, though, in my life that have been so transformative to really um, challenge some of those voices that we have within ourselves that are telling us that we can't do something or that we shouldn't do something or as you're naming that are catastrophizing right and saying yeah. oh my goodness if you do this thing it's going to be horrible for the all these reasons right yeah and i think you know it's a fair thing to do i mean you know yes i'm catastrophizing but you're also taking information from the world right. around you and seeing right. what's you know in my case specifically seeing what's happened to other athletes who have kind of come out in this way a lot of the time especially at the professional level it kind of just means the end of your career and i think that there's a few different reasons, but I think personally for me, one of the reasons I can already see why that might be is because when you do come out and you're one of the only people in that kind of space to do so, you look around and you're like, well, there's nobody else doing this work and there's important work to be done. And then you realize, well, sport is important, but this is also really important. So right. you kind of end up splitting your focus and also dealing with all this outside noise that you didn't have to deal with before. So I think that it's just, there's so many different factors that it can be really difficult to kind of convince yourself to do it because you get so caught up in all of those different, very real worries, but also not entirely all encompassing, if that makes sense. Definitely. And I feel like in a way like that fear, it was definitely right. You know, I think, as you said, it does destroy careers because it creates other careers, right? <laughs> like it, it, And sometimes, you know, I think that is also something important to name, too, is that sometimes destruction is necessary, right? Yeah. Sometimes things need to fall apart and come back together. And and sometimes something's wanting to emerge. I think that's also something that I've um, seen um, happen a lot in my life. For example, I'm a trained psychotherapist right and mm -hmm. the year that um i got my license um my tarot card since i do tarot also my tarot card was the death card that year <laughs> and i was like what does that mean like how's that going to show up in my life and the moment i got my licensure as a therapist i also got invited to an artist fellowship that would take me away from california right and yeah. it was this big kind of juncture of like okay i could kind of really lean into therapy or i could take this big risk and move mm -hmm. towards this other passion i have and so that is a way that a death can happen, right? Is that you can kind of be presented sometimes with these like options, or you could be presented sometimes with this kind of moment that you could say, I can take this step, but it does mean that things are gonna change forever in my life, essentially. Yeah, I mean, cause I've, I've really wanted to kind of prioritize the being outspoken and, you know, really trying to get involved with activism because I think it's just such a rare opportunity to be able to take something that I'm so passionate about. Like I've been, spending my whole life pursuing this thing which is rugby and to now be able to kind of step forward in that space and do something that I've not seen other people do is really meaningful to me and like something that I'm really passionate about and it's probably one of the only things that I've ever felt as passionate about as I do about rugby <laughs> so like being able to combine them in some way is something that it's, it's not you know I can't just ignore it I can't necessarily just push it off to the side I really want to focus on it and see where it takes me, you know, and see what kind of opportunities that that will open, not just for myself, but hopefully for other people too. Definitely. Yeah. And there is like a groundbreaking kind of nature to this, that you're kind of, you're creating a path where there wasn't a path. Right. And mm -hmm. you're also inspiring other people to kind of following your footstep. Right. And I'm imagining there are a lot of people out there who are playing professional sports, who are potentially in the closet and yeah. who are hearing about your story and being like, oh, wow, this person did this. And 
their career didn't end, right? They, <laughs> as a matter of fact, they got another career added to their career. Um, <laughs> and now they're doing something that's so beneficial and like really sharing a message that's so important, especially during a time where we are seeing a rise in, you know, anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ bills that are being passed in this country. And so it's so important for there to be voices that are um, challenging, you know, some of this uh, really harmful rhetoric that's been going around in this country. Yeah, and it's that was something that was kind of in the back of my mind before coming out is I was seeing all those issues and all these LGBTQ issues and it's like I didn't feel as comfortable being outspoken about them because then it's it's sort of, you know, you're that closet athlete and you're like, oh, well, this invites questions, right? I'm the only outspoken professional male rugby player who's going to be all of a sudden posting about, you know, how much I support the you know, trans rights and the LGBTQ community, I was like, well, I, am I just going to be outing myself in that way? Like, I didn't feel like, and then it's also like, am I speaking all these issues where people are going to assume that I'm straight and they're going to be like, well, how do you have a right to speak on these issues and the impact that they have? So I think that also coming out really gave me a license to kind of speak on those issues and say the reason I can, not, not necessarily the reason I am speaking on these issues, but the reason I'm speaking on these issues from this perspective is because it affects me and people that I care about in this way, and it's also just not right. So I think that before I came out, there was uh, legislation by World Rugby where they actually decided to go a complete 180 on what their policies have been for pretty much the entirety that there's been you know, this governing body, and they changed it to outright banning trans, trans women specifically from competing in international competition despite the fact that there are currently no trans women competing internationally, I think from what I've found out in my research is that there are currently two who are playing at like a professional adjacent or, you know, within like the larger pool of athletes being considered for international competition. Um, but this was a, you know, movement that they said they felt was necessary after they looked at the, you know, quote unquote, data and scientific evidence, they said that there was no way that they could, you know, ensure women's safety at this time playing against, you know, trans athletes, despite the fact that they couldn't point to a single example of somebody displaying that level of dominance or endangering other athletes in that way. So that was something that really upset me. But same thing, I was like, I'm in the closet and I don't see any other men speaking up on this issue. Like, how do I get involved? So that's been something I've been really grateful that I'm now that I've come out, I can kind of say, well, let's all start speaking up about this issue. Let's not stay on the sideline just because you're not trans or you don't know somebody who identifies in that way. I think it's important to just try to get involved in whatever way you can if you know you're sticking up for something that right now is just, it's wrong what's happening. And I really hope that more people will see that. Definitely. It's it's so wrong. Um, you know, someone who's really helped me a lot um, with understanding kind of the political, social reasons why the, these kinds of laws get brought into um, into the legislature is um, Alok Vaid Menon. I don't know if you know them. They're mm-hmm. this amazing um, artist. Um, I can definitely share um, a little bit of that information. Um, but one of the things that they um, have shared is that, like, you know, when you kind of direct the focus onto the bodies of certain people, right, as you're named, there are two maybe trans women who are playing professional rugby. So when you kind of put the, the, the almost the, the onus on these people to either like validate themselves or to say or to kind of put them into a place where they're not seen as safe you're kind of taking the attention away from the larger systemic political issues that are uh, behind this that there is inequity for people of all genders within different sports right there's deep inequity and that if we focus on trans people if we focus on trans bodies it takes away it actually gives more power to cis straight white men who are continuing to be in domination and power and takes power away from people of all other genders and um, types from actually asking for more power or asking for more equity. Um, that's, And I think that's something that's been really important to kind of see that there, um, there are real political social reasons why these laws get brought up is to really um, detract from a larger systemic change that needs to happen, which is really, you know, I think really important to kind of see how much inequity there is for people of all genders, right? Not just trans people, but, you know, women and cis people and people of uh, different 
backgrounds there's so much inequity and i think yeah. these are brought in to kind of derail the conversation and to kind of position the idea of safety as like the concern where as you said there are no known cases of yeah. trans women actually doing anything and yeah i mean you you go into it there is like it's it's all very planned and it's all very strategic like the the way that they're doing this is not an accident they're not the sudden you know concern that they have for women's safety it's it's never been about that right it's about them trying to package a message a discriminatory message in a way that appeals to people and affirms their own beliefs about you know right doing things for safety. One example of that is, you know, the bill that's going through in Alabama where they're, you know, about to criminalize affirming, you know, a trans kid or a trans person at all and make it a crime not only for the doctors but also potentially the parents as well as the kid themselves. That act, despite what I just described to you, is known as the, you know, Compassion for Vulnerable <laughs> Children Act. And it's like you present that to people who already feel like, you know, trans people are villains or that they have been forced into transitioning by these ultra liberal parents is sort of this like right. narrative that gets thrown around and when you package it in that way it just tells them it signals that they're doing the right thing right it's like oh i'm standing up for children who are being manipulated and being targeted and it's it's so harmful and like i said intentional what they're doing it's being done in a way not only to take attention off of real inequity, like you're saying, but also putting attention on trying to villainize trans people and just the idea of being a trans person. Right. Yeah. And, you know, to focus on this when we're in the middle of a pandemic still, right, yeah. <laughs> where so many people don't have access to healthcare in general, like, it's like that those are things that really could benefit so many people but you know <laughs> yeah it is definitely a moment of derailing conversation and also as you said validating fears and insecurities that people have um, around difference right around nonconformity, around also the expansion um, and in some ways also the decolonization of how we see gender because yeah. you know as we know um, a lot of people use the rhetoric that queer and trans people are new this is like a new postmodern yes reality and you know trans people have existed in all sorts of cultures for thousands of years yeah. the binary is a the binary itself is a new construction you know yeah. and yeah but that's like a whole other conversation <laughs> well what's new is you know what's new is they're not accepting being pushed to the margins and you know it's starting to be in the mainstream and so it's actually you know to the point where they're having to confront that this is actually something that exists and that this is a real population of people who as you said have been ignored for as long back as you can go really they've tried to marginalize and erase our history so i think that it's important that it's finally kind of starting to shift at least in the sense that it is in the public eye but then it brings in all these other issues of well now they want to get it out of the public eye and they want to <laughs> you know demonize it um but I think that was also something that stood, stood out to me with the you know, trans ban in world rugby was it was really kind of championed by this group known as Fair Play for Women, which is another group which is trying to package itself in a very specific way, right? Oh, well, who's not for Fair Play for Women? Right. But what they actually do is they advocate for you know, excluding trans women from women's only spaces like prisons and shelters and things that are just inherently harmful to trans people, but also to women, because I think that historically there's been a kinship between trans women and cis women in a lot of ways where they have found community in each other in sort of the marginalization they've experienced and right. being able to support each other. So seeing that and seeing that fair play for women, quote unquote, was one of the people who was allowed, you know, from what I heard at the World Rugby proceedings, it was World Rugby and then there were trans athletes who were being asked about their experiences and being told that they were anecdotal. And then Fair Play for Women, which is a known, you know, trans exclusionary group. And these are the three kind of bodies. So it's cis white men, trans exclusionary group, and then the actual people being affected by it who are being told that their experiences are, like I said, anecdotal and kind of irrelevant is what they were being told. So that's how they formed these kinds of decisions, and that's how a lot of these sort of decisions are being made, is they're being packaged by groups, like I said, that are trying to kind of signal that they're fighting for women's equality or they're fighting for equity, but it's all kind of a guise just so they can 
continue to demonize trans people. Yeah, and I think this is really speaks to the importance of um, creating other forms of media, other forms of engagement, you know, and also um, creating other ways of um, entering into these conversations and why it's so important, you know, for you to be someone who's really using your platform to bring these issues forward. And because I think, you know, you're, you're someone who creates like a really wonderful bridge into a community that maybe wasn't aware of trans exclusionary tactics, right? And, yeah. um, and I think... I, I think one thing I've really learned in these last couple of years is, you know, especially with uh, fake news and, and seeing yes. how media is really weaponized, right? How media is weaponized and how um, information is weaponized and how, you know, a lack of information really keeps people in a place of fear yeah. um, or when information gets twisted, right? Or, or rhetoric gets twisted or when things get used um, in a way where, as you're saying, it seems like it's doing good, but it's actually really harming another group of people. Um, and that's why it's important to bring these things forward and to have these conversations because the more media we can create to kind of challenge those narratives, I think is um, really can be really beneficial because then that, that information gets out there, right? Yeah, I think that that was something that I kind of experienced with my coming out story that I wasn't necessarily hadn't really considered or expected was getting to work with a lot of LGBTQ media outlets and telling my story through them you find that a lot of them tell the story the way that you experienced it and that they're willing to tell your experience authentically whereas when you go to more mainstream media outlets it's more about packaging a story in a way that is going to mm. appeal to a broad group of people it's not necessarily about relaying the actual authentic experience of the person you know i'm not saying it's necessarily done in a intentionally nefarious way every time it's done but it's something that is very noticeable is kind of small ways they try to censor queer stories to make it less about being gay or being queer and more about you know overcoming trials and tribulations or you know in my case specifically a lot more of the focus was on injuries that i've kind of overcome along the way um, I recently um, hosted in a class that I'm a part of this artist named Candace Brights, and um, her her whole talk was called um, TLDR, uh, which is like an acronym that means yeah. too long didn't read, right? And and her whole um, kind of thing that she explores in her artwork is how um, attention is weaponized and attention and our lack of attention is something that's been um, kind of shaped within us, right? And how mm -hmm. a lot of news outlets need to get their stories within like a 10 second frame yeah. and need to kind of also flatten and dis distill stories. And I think yeah. that that's, yeah, and like what that does to the human psyche and what that does to all our ability to sit with complexity or to yeah. sit with, you know, to sit with the whole of a person. Yeah, it erases complexity, right? I mean, a lot of, and you know, it's, it's never necessarily intentional, but obviously a lot of the questions I'll get around my coming out are like, you know, what what inspired you to do it? You know, like, what was the one thing that really, like, was the catalyst? And I'm like, <laughs> right. I had 16 years of catalysts. And, like, even for me to choose, like, four of those catalysts is going to give me, you know, I'm, you're going to take a 20, you're going to listen to me talk for 20 minutes is what's going to happen. <laughs> but it's like they, it's, it's hard to do that because it's like you do want to talk about your experience and some of the things that led along the way. But it's like, well, how do I do that in a way that's authentic? when really what they're looking for me to do is, like you say, distill it and kind of flatten it in a way that, you know, is packaged for them in an easily digestible way. We want to, yeah, talk a little bit about mental health um, and you know how you've seen mental health throughout your life and also how you're seeing it now and if that's shifted at all in this pandemic. Yeah, so I mentioned how I went to the alternative school when I was around 12. I think that, you know, I had a lot of issues with my mental health when I was very young. I, you know, I had to see therapists through a lot of my kind of formative years and a lot of it was kind of centered around um, issues with anger and kind of like controlling my anger. I was kind of the type of kid who I was very emotional and I was very sensitive and eventually I would kind of get to a point where I would just internalize everything and eventually you kind of just fly off the handle, right? And I didn't really have ways to not only control it, but like express it in a healthy way in a school setting. Like I said, I had parents at home who were very understanding, but I didn't get that kind of same messaging 
as a kid in a public school setting where I'm being told to sit in one place and I think a lot of the anger came from not liking being told what to do and <laughs> you know um, struggling to connect with the people around me um, and that was kind of a theme throughout a lot of my childhood where I really struggled to kind of behave in those sort of settings where you're expected to act in a certain way and it actually wasn't until I found rugby that that issue kind of disappeared. I now had this new outlet where I could expend energy and even you know if I was feeling angry well then cool I can go tackle somebody after school today and I think that that was like a very healthy way that I ended up kind of learning to control my emotions as well um, and you know with rugby your emotions can either be a detriment or they can help you <laughs> mm. yeah and I think that's really important to state that um not everyone fits in into the school system. Not no. everyone fits in into, not. yeah, not everyone fits in neatly into categories. Not everyone um, is able to sit at a desk for eight hours a day. Like that there are bodies that are different, that are needing, as you're saying, physical exercise, that are needing to be outside. Or, um, you know, I know for myself, I grew up with a lot of anxiety and I didn't know how to work with it. And, you know, it's not something I really was taught about. It's not something I really talked about. So for a lot of my life, I really struggled with anxiety yeah. and with wondering if that was just how my life was going to be, that I was just going to be like always afraid of everything. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's challenging when we're kind of forced to be within certain environments. And then mm -hmm. when our bodies and our beings are not acknowledged as like as unique as having needs it's so great that your parents were able to kind of notice that and say hey let's find something <laughs> to like really support Devin in this space because I think it's um and so it, it, a message to anyone who's struggling like to know that it could you know I think it could be easy to blame yourself or it could be yeah. easy for others to blame you, but sometimes it can also be the environment you're in Absolutely. and that there are some adjustments that might be needed to support you. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when I started taking up rugby, I started to, you know, it really started this kind of transformation of just me as a person of, you know, kind of acknowledging that I was having sort of these feelings of anger and things like that, but that it didn't necessarily have to be uncontrolled and that, you know, I could just, the time that I can be angry could be the time when the whistle blows and we're in the middle of a match. And that's a time where it's okay to have a little bit of anger to kind of fuel you forward. So I think that over time it became a way that I really learned to control my emotions. And even, and this is something that I think a lot of kind of queer people deal with over their lives is I kind of learned ways to weaponize my anger in a productive way. Right? Mm. I think that a lot of queer people take, um, inspiration from being told that they can't do things, right? And being, <laughs> and being told that you're not going to be able to succeed or that, you know, a person who's like you could never succeed in this way. And I think that for me in rugby, I kind of got by on that feeling for a while where I was like, okay, well, I might not feel totally comfortable being myself in this space, but it doesn't mean I can't prove everybody wrong the, every single step along the way and use that as a way to motivate myself. And you know, I would go into matches and a lot of what I was known for as a player was just being extremely intense and being, you know, caring more about it than the person next to me. And a lot of that came from putting myself in a place where I was kind of fueled by negativity, which I think in a lot of ways was very powerful for me. But I think I was also spending a lot of my life focusing on negative because it's mm. like I now realized I had this power to pull from something negative it almost became like a crutch where I had to pull from negative things to put myself into a space to perform. So for example, and you know, I've, I've told this story a couple times, but there was a wrestler named Dan Gable who was this incredibly successful American athlete, won the Olympics. And when he was young, he experienced tragedy in his life where his parents were actually killed in a home invasion and they never found out who did it. And before every match, he would convince himself that the person he was facing off against was the person who had murdered oh his family God. they never caught. And that was how he got, and he was incredible. That's like so he, intense. Exactly, it was incredibly <laughs> intense. And he would train himself into the ground, he would win every tournament, and do things that other people weren't willing to do because 
he fueled himself with negativity in that way. And I think on a very, very small, less intense version of that, I would fuel myself by convincing myself that the people I was playing against were homophobic. And that if they right. knew that I was the way that I was, that they would try to take away from the things that I accomplished and that they would make fun of me or tell me that I didn't belong in the sport. And that's kind of what fueled me for this kind of 12 year career is everyone's like, man, that guy's really intense. And it's like, well, it's because he's convinced himself that <laughs> you are all his enemy. And I think that that was how I sort of <laughs> channeled my mental health and went from being this kid who just had kind of uncontrollable anger to being extremely poised mm. off of the field, but very intense on the field. And so I think that it rugby did give me a way to kind of learn to compartmentalize emotions in a way that is healthy. Um, but I think that it also got me to a point where, like I said, I became very comfortable with the idea that negativity is what fueled me. Um, but I think that I'm also fueled by positivity. I just didn't have as many positive things to pull from that motivated me in that way. Yeah. And, you know, I think as someone who practices like witchcraft and magic, I, I, the word that comes up in what you're sharing is transmutation. Mm -hmm. That's like a big kind of um, theme within alchemy is that we're able to work with something and turn it into something else. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that it's important to name that, like, there can be such great power that comes from hearing a no, from being yeah. told that you're not good enough, from, from being rejected and that those can be really like really catalyst for change for powerful change and also at some point it can be really hard to constantly be needing that right to be needing that anger or that rejection just to kind of keep going forward and so i'd love to ask you like now that you've come out and that your story's out there at, when you're playing rugby like what do you feel now is like fueling you or is there something else that you're working with now well, that's the thing is I haven't played a full contact match since I came out. So I'm like, I've, I've done, you know, I've played some touch here and there. And I think in general, when I'm playing and I'm training, it's a much more lighthearted thing where I'm just sort of enjoying what I do and loving the game. Um, but I am a little bit interested to see how it's going to translate because that's, I mean, I also happen to play a position in rugby where, you know, when I was playing at the professional level, a lot of what they talk to you about is they're literally analyzing your performance by the amount, and this is a direct quote, by the amount of collisions that you get into. So I'm expected to go out there and be especially physical and really throw myself out there in that way, which I'm, I'm interested to see, like, you know, how am I gonna respond when I'm not fueled to do that because I'm angry and just being fueled to do that because I wanna, you know, play the sport and be good at the sport. So I think it is gonna be a bit of an interesting experiment and I'd be surprised if I don't play in a slightly different way um, We'll see if that's a positive or a negative. I guess that remains to be seen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I feel I feel like I can do it. I don't think that I necessarily need the anger. I think that it was very successful for what it was. And <laughs> I, I think that I'm ready to start kind of pulling from different things and different emotions and not just, you know, like you said, I think when you get only kind of negative feedback, you convince yourself that like, well, this is what I need to succeed, right? I need that. I kind of need that to thrive on now. But I think it's just also I just can thrive on positivity. I just need to get used to, like you said, figuring out a way to transmute it in a way that will also allow me to succeed in rugby. Yeah, and to think of the the platform that you have now, right? That you now, you know, even though let's say regardless of how many people will be in the stadium watching you play, you will have like, you know, thousands of people now yeah. really interested in what you're doing and and in a way, you know, that's another energy to work with too, right? For is sure. wow, I, I'm I'm someone who's being looked at and respected by so many people. Um, that's such an amazing kind of thing to hold, right? And yeah, and I guess, you know, I, I definitely can resonate with that, um, with the kind of being fueled by anger or by rejection. Yeah. It's something that I've really worked with a lot myself, and I feel really grateful that I have the constitution that kind of enjoys rejection or yeah. enjoys being told no. <laughs> I know not everyone is like that. Yeah. Um, and so I, def I definitely think it's a good thing to let let people know that that not might not be your first reaction. You might get a no and be like, oh, okay, that sucks, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, um, but, but that, you know, it can be healthy sometimes to work with that no 
and to work with that rejection or with that emotion. And it's definitely something I use a lot in my art. Um, I definitely work a lot with my, you know, what we would consider negative emotions, right, in my art, because I think it's it's important to let those emotions move through us and work with them. Um, and also, in a sense, like to also not like demonize them or see yeah. them as negative, right? Anger is super powerful. Anger is really it's important. Especially if and you're trying to do something physical. <laughs> it's, it's so it's helpful. <laughs> definitely and and even in a way if we're trying to also change laws too right like yeah. i'm fucking angry about yep. these anti-trans laws and i think that's also what's fueling you know some of the activism and yeah. amplification of these things is we're mad and we're mad that like queer and trans people are still being relegated to a position where we have to prove ourselves or where yeah. we have to like validate our existence like those are all things that I think are fueling so many people now. And it, it does like warm my heart to see people um, entering into the political sphere more yeah. and really challenging some of these things. Um, but before we get too much into another conversation, mm -hmm. I would love to um, just ask you, you know, in terms of the pandemic, like, have you noticed any changes in your mental health? I know that's something that um, I definitely hear a lot about from my friends. Um, would just love to hear um, any shifts that you've made in yourself that have helped you or that you've noticed during this time yeah um, I was in a really bad place before the pandemic started um, I'd had the season that I'd signed the contract so I, I signed in 2019 and you know I told my partner when I first met him in 2017 or around 2018 was when I first told him this I was saying you know I wanted to be out in rugby and that you know I ideally I wanted to be the first professional out in rugby because I wanted to have as big of an impact as I could and when I signed that contract I still wasn't at a place where I was like well now I can just come out right because I've made it I was in a place where I was like okay now I have this contract I need to make sure that I entrench myself and that I make sure that I'm a pillar of this team mm -hmm. that I really position myself in the community in a way that people will know that well, this isn't just some guy they gave a contract because they needed to you know, show that they're woke or that they're, you know, virtue signaling. It's somebody who really earned his way onto that team and really right. fought tooth and nail and loves the sport. And so I really let that narrative control me. And I spent so much of my time and thought process basing my own success and my own kind of openness around my sexuality around other people's perceptions of my accomplishments and of my talent as a rugby player. So in 2019, I signed that contract and following 2019, I had an injury where I was kind of concerned if the 2020 season was even gonna happen for me. And kind of right as I was working my way back and really kind of grappling with the feelings of being a failure because I had spent this whole year of my life really putting everything into this goal. I mean, I was waking up at 3.50 a.m. four days out of the week to go train and do our rugby practices for two hours before going to work. I would start work at 7 a.m. and then I would work until 3.30 p.m. and then I would go to the gym from 4 until 6.30 and then I would go home and I would eat and I would sleep. And that was my life for a year. And it was all for this goal of I wanted to accomplish this. So right. when I had that injury and it became a realization that maybe I've let this opportunity pass me by, I really fell into a depression and I really felt like I had this chance to do something that I didn't end up doing and that thought really weighed very heavily on me and right as I was working my way back from injury that's when the pandemic hit was they canceled the rest of the season and now I was faced with the reality that there's not going to be rugby for a year and you've been basing your whole coming out journey on what you've accomplished in rugby so it's like I don't have this thing I can point to and say well once I've accomplished this I can come out so that was sort of the context that sort of set me up into my kind of later feelings as I got closer to when I actually made the decision to come out. That's just where my, that's where my mindset was before right. the pandemic even started. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So it, in, I'm imagining, you know, you also had that time to kind of sit with this decision, right. And to also sit with the, um, yeah, as you're naming the nuances that come with making this decision and also having a contract and and also being in the middle of a pandemic when no one's able to play sports. Yeah. Um, yeah, and what are some things that you feel have really like supported you during this time or were there things that supported you when you were in that place of depression? 
I mean, it was my family's always been amazing, but I mean, it was my partner. I mean, it was my it was my partner through and through. You know, like we mm. don't live in the same place. He lives in the UK. I live in Boston, and we'd be FaceTiming every single day, and you know, we'd be talking every single day, and we were each other's support systems in that way, and. You know, like you said, the pandemic really gave me time to sit with this and the idea that I haven't done this. And, you know, it was right at the very end of the pandemic that, or not the pandemic, but the end of the year in December, um, that that's when I made that decision to finally, you know, come forward and come out. And what led to that was, you know, I, I mentioned I'd already been struggling. And in November of 2020, um, I had a puppy who was very close to us and was our family puppy and she suddenly passed away at mm -hmm. just a year old and she had been just like such a massive support for me throughout the pandemic and I know that a lot of people have had a lot of really horrible things and losses happen to them that make yeah. mine seem not quite as um, extreme but for me that was one of the few kind of bits of positivity I was holding on to being separated from my partner and not having rugby and it really just destroyed me. I mean, I yeah. stopped being able to do basic things. I stopped being able to stay on top of, you know, cleaning my room or, you know, basic hygiene. And I really fell into this very depressed state where I was like, not only have I failed at this goal that I set for myself, I also don't see a path forward for myself. And I got into this place where it's like, we're in a pandemic. I don't see a path towards being with my partner. I don't see a path towards expressing myself in rugby. And I don't see a path towards coming out because I was basing it on accomplishing enough in a rugby world. So when that happened, that's when I really sat down and, you know, I was in that state for a few weeks and I really had to sit down and just say, I need to pull myself out of this in one way or another. And I mm. think that it's important that I try to take control of a few of the things that I can take control of. And that's when I just sort of wrote out a list. I mean, some of them were just things to do every day. Like I said, just basic things that you need to do to stay, take care of yourself. But then others were long-term goals and things that I still wanted to accomplish. And one of those was coming out. And, you know, as the weeks went by, that was something that was still on my list. And as the year was coming to a close, I mean, I, came, I made my post on December 29th. I was just at a place where I'm like, we're about to go into a new year and my partner's about to have a birthday three days after that new year and I'm still not in a place where I can even feel like I can just like post publicly and say happy birthday or happy anniversary and like that idea just weighed really heavy on me is I'm like, I'm going through all this stuff. I'm not happy with the things going on around me and feeling like I can't make positive changes. I'm like, what's stopping me from doing this? And I think that when I had that realization that it was something I could take control over and that nobody could tell me that I couldn't do, I mean, this is something I wanted to do for myself, um, that's what really led me to making the decision and just deciding that it was something I needed to do for myself but also for my partner and, more importantly, my mental health because I couldn't keep on holding that weight of not accomplishing something that I knew was so important to me. Right. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think it's really important to hear that, that that's like where you were coming from before this decision came. And yeah, the, I think the level of, um, the things that compounded, I'm just kind of sitting with that, like so many things compounded <laughs> to, you know, to kind of get you to that place. And yeah. also really hearing how, you know, your partner Gus was just like a big, a big resource for you at the time. And, you know, to kind of sit with like, wow, I'm not even going to be able to publicly share my love and care and, and celebration of his birthday. Like, yeah, those things really kind of pulling you towards, okay, what's a decision I can make? And, yeah, and you know, I I'm someone who like I, I I was there when I saw you make that first post, and I remember just being like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting! <laughs> wow, like someone coming out in such a public way and also sharing their love for their partner, like how beautiful. Um, yeah, um, and how do you feel like now, having made that decision, and like kind of maybe looking back at you know that person that was suffering and that was like in a really you know a, a heavy place, like a lot of us have been, right? It's yeah. like it, this hasn't been an easy time for many of us. Um, how do you feel now, looking back at them, and um, now you know months after you've made that decision? I think the biggest thing I think about looking back is I just I feel incredibly emotional and kind of proud because I know how many lows that I had and I know how 
you know, difficult it was and literal nights where I'm just like with my partner sobbing because I feel like I've, like I said, like I feel like I've failed and I feel like I've not only let myself down, but I felt like I'd let down people who I sought to kind of inspire and, you know, try to do something positive for. So I think that when I look back at that and I think about now where I see all this positivity and I see more importantly, a path for myself. Like I think that, you know, a lot of Fergus's questions for me were like, okay, well you play rugby and you're, you're very good at rugby, but like, what is your plan? Like, what do you, like, what do you want to do Mm. beyond that? Like, what do you want to do with your life? And for me, I was just always kind of like, well, you know, rugby, I want to keep doing stuff with rugby more and more. And I think that when I came out, it, it, it showed me that the path that was always there for me that I just never embraced was to kind of combine rugby with just being myself and putting my story out there and focusing on things that I'm passionate about in like an authentic way. And I think that seeing something so organically just sort of pop up like that, that you feel so happy with and that you feel so proud of, like that's been the biggest difference for me is, you know, yes, I still have days where I feel down and I have days where I feel overwhelmed and, you know, coming out was not a perfect band aid on my life that made everything magically better. Right. But it gave me this overarching hope and it gave me this overarching joy where I felt like, you know, no matter how not ideal things might be and the fact that I'm still separated from my partner, we have all these amazing things that are happening and all these amazing ways that we can help other people. And I think that's been the biggest difference for me is just feeling that sort of fulfillment and knowing that there's still so much that I can do as well. Right. I think that it's, It was hard for a lot of people during the pandemic to be seeing that sort of possibility of what can I do? You you feel so trapped and you feel so kind of just focused on what's in front of you. So to kind of break free from that and now see, well, actually, I have more possibilities available to me than I ever thought were possible has been like incredibly empowering and also just like very emotional, emotional for me and my partner who's been there with me for those years and seen everything that I went through along the way. Yeah, and and it can be really, really powerful and a a big moment in someone's life when, you know, they make that decision to reclaim their power and to take their power back. Um, Because I think um, a lot of us have struggled with those moments where we um, are hearing either doubts that we have ourselves or doubts that we've internalized um, and also fears that come up. And also, I think, you know, this, you brought up the path, right? And I think, I, I know that for myself, I've also struggled with that. I know a lot of people struggle with that, not knowing what they're meant to do or if they're doing the right thing. And yeah, that could also be a really scary place. And I think sometimes when you make big decisions and you kind of, you know, you decide to step into another arena or you decide to step into another part of your life, you're also creating, you're creating the path. You're you're um, allowing the path to be made through you. And um, as someone who has multiple careers and I don't know what my life is going to look like, I, I'm still, you know, growing and emerging. I really, I think it's important to name that um, there is no one path, you know, that there are many, many paths and that many of us are going to move through you know, different parts of our life. And there will be things that are exciting that we'll do for a moment. And there are things that will emerge from that and grow into something else. And I think something I've just noticed from you, Devin, that I really appreciate is that you're someone who's really, um, you're able to share and be open and also create connections so easily. You're able to really, um, yeah, to be authentic and be honest. And I think those are things that, you know, can really benefit you no matter where you are, (laughs) you know, and also, and also do speak of like, you know, I have gifts, right? I, I'm I'm powerful on the field. I'm powerful when I channel my rage, mm-hmm. and I'm also can be powerful when I'm, you know, making being vulnerable, yeah. making connections with people, sharing my story, um, uplifting the story of others. Those are also things that I think you're really gifted at, and I'm really grateful to see that in this journey that that's kind of emerged for you. And I'm just so happy to also support you in amplifying your story and letting other people learn about you because I'm just like thrilled that you're, um, that you exist, you know, as, oh. as a, as a person that, um, yeah, that I, you know, is gender non-conforming and that has had a tenuous relationship with this idea of masculinity. Yeah. Like I really appreciate, um, seeing masculinity through a lens of care and through a lens of also, um, vulnerability. I think those are things that you've really, um, shared that are really important. Oh, thank you so much. That's very sweet of you. Yeah, and I, I think that 
that's something that I really want to focus on, you know, because a lot of the questions I get are from, you know, rugby coaches that I've even had or fellow, you know, cis, you know, heterosexual men who I play with is, you know, what ways can we make this space more inclusive and what ways can we make this space safer for LGBTQ people? And, you know, a lot of it is what you expect to hear, which is talking about the language that's used and, you know, welcoming them into that space in that way. But I think the most important thing that doesn't get talked about is what you just talked about, which is vulnerability. I mean, when when you go into a space of, like you say, cis men or heterosexual men who might be perceived as being very hyper-masculine, who also have no issues opening up about themselves and the struggles that they've experienced and the ways that's affected them, like that as a queer person is something you're not used to seeing. And I think that that kind of shows you that you can also be vulnerable in that space. So I think that when you're talking about ways to make those spaces more inclusive, it's not just about, well, how can I focus on making it more inclusive for this one specific group? It's about making it a space where everybody feels like they can be themselves in that way Mm -hmm. and share that part of themselves. So that is something that I think is really important to me to show is that it's not just about, you know, well, we want gay people to be able to talk about being gay and their experiences. It's about, well, we want all people to be able to come into this space and feel like it's a place they can connect and be themselves. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and how do we create a space where men don't feel like they have to put up these walls, right? Yeah. Or where, where um, you know, cis butch men don't feel like they have to um, create a, a toxic environment to be able to connect, right? Where there can be an acceptance of difference, an acceptance of vulnerability. Um, but also at the same time, you know, knowing that it's also important to play and to be, you know, to joke around and to kind of be silly. Like For those sure. are also really important and things and I think that's something I also really appreciate about you is that you're someone who's really silly and weird and <laughs> that you kind of embody you know that you're you've been in Attitude magazine as like a model and that you're also this like weirdo who puts on like outfits and <laughs> I really appreciate that like kind of um, juxtaposition also because I think people need to see that you can be a model and that you can also be a weirdo on the you know on the field and dress up however you want to as well yeah I think that you know we all have we're not all one way, right? Like, you know, I think that especially in social media, you get this kind of pull of like, you need to present yourself in one way, right? Like you need to have a brand, you need to be a consistent representation of yourself. And it's like, being yourself is a consistent (laughs) representation of yourself, whatever that, whatever that may mean, you know? And I think for me, I want to be able, yeah, I want to be able to be silly because I'm really not this overly serious person. I'm happy to talk about serious issues, but you know, I've, I've always been a very kind of silly person, but I think in a lot of ways I didn't express that. I was, I mean, if you talk to people I went to college with, they know me as the extremely serious person who was very focused on a goal and was very like, this is what I'm about and I'm not going to be anything outside of that. And a lot of that was just out of a fear of opening up, right? And about a fear of being yourself. So I think that now that I have this platform and I have this kind of space where I can be myself, like the last thing I want to do is pigeonhole myself and say oh I'm just a model or I'm just a you know an advocate or an activist or you know I I just want to be me and kind of show my life and my partner yeah yeah I love that same I'm definitely on that same boat with you (laughs) I'm also you know I I'm someone who loves to be expansive and not limit myself in terms of the things I I think even like I'm imagining some people might be like what are you doing interviewing a rugby player (laughs) you know like I think that those are things that um, I'm yeah and I I'm someone who you know I feel very guided by my intuition and I think there are moments where you know your intuition just tells you to do something and you might be like why the hell are you telling me to do this thing (laughs) I think it's so important to listen to that voice um and to let yourself go down those paths sometimes um and to also not let people's perceptions of you limit you and limit who you uh, might be wanting to become yeah well awesome I I'm just so grateful for the time that we've been able to share um and I'm just really glad that we've been able to connect and um yeah and also would love to just really quickly ask you um if you would like to share your thoughts on RuPaul's Drag Race because I know that's something that we also (laughs) talked about that I want to just make sure we touch on um I just want to 
yeah, just, I guess, because there's two seasons going on right now, for those who don't know. <laughs> we have RuPaul's Drag Race UK and the one here in the United States. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, well, this is great that you asked me because I feel like, I, like I've like i mentioned in other times in interviews, I'm like, this is also something we can talk about. And I just end up talking about all this other stuff for so long. That they're just <laughs> like, well, I guess we can include the Drag Race stuff. And I'm like, but I want to talk about Drag Race. I know, because <laughs> it, it was I, I, I had such an amazing time listening to the podcast that you were on with was it willem in alaska right yeah yeah it was, was so good it was amazing i was yeah. crazy crazy nervous for that one. <laughs> <laughs> i would imagine i'll make sure to link that in the description of this video too in case anyone wants to listen to that oh that'd be awesome um but yeah for those seasons i mean i guess we're starting with the uk i haven't seen the most recent u.s episode because me and fergus run on like a two to three day delay because we watch together over facetime <laughs> So oh, that's so cute. <laughs> it's cute, but it also is it can yeah, be spoiler also, heavy at this time. Yeah, of exactly. Year. Stay off social media. <laughs> yeah. And I follow all of them as well, so it's like I, I can't escape sometimes. But for the UK version, I mean, I think it's uh, Bimini Bamboo Lash is is gonna win. I mean, there's no, and like looking at the last episode, I was like. Ellie Diamond is so great and so talented, and this is not at all a slight on Ellie Diamond, but I feel like it's kind of pointless to have Ellie in the finale when everybody is aware that Ellie's not going to win. And I've always kind of felt like that's a weird thing with Drag Race when you get to this point of the season where it's like, all right, it's obvious that either Bimini or Lawrence is going to win. Then it's like, but you still have other people in the finale where it's like, well, anybody could still win, right? And it's like, well, really, it's about these two people. So it's like... Let's just suspend, you know, disbelief yeah. for a moment. And... <laughs> so it's always like a weird thing when that happens, especially because like Bimini's won like whatever. It's been like like three out of the last like five weeks or something. I don't know, but it's been it's been ridiculous. So it's definitely... It's definitely going to be Bimini, I think. But the US version, I, I haven't seen what happened this week, but... I'm trying to think who's going to win. I mean, honestly, Gottmik, I think, is going to win. Um, like, not only because they're just so incredibly talented and they've kind of been having that, like, mid-season shift where, like, they have the unexpected dominant snatch game followed by, you know, winning other challenges straight after that. I feel like that's, like, a very typical sort of, like, late season right. swing and also just got Mc being just like an icon for the trans community and representing in that way i'm sure it wouldn't hurt when <laughs> they're thinking about who to crown <laughs> i know and they've yeah i'm definitely team bimini team B got Mc also um <laughs> and uh, yeah i think um I'm excited to see Ellie Diamond come back for All Stars. I'm excited to see, yeah, because I think um, I'm definitely, you know, I'm rooting for Ellie Diamond just because, not to say that she's going to win, because yeah, I also no, agree I, with I what you Ellie. said, <laughs> but um, I'm just rooting for her just because of her story. And I think that yeah. is like the thing that I love about Drag Race too is that, like, it, you know, people are able to come in as their authentic selves and to hear that, you know, Ellie Diamond was working at a fast food restaurant. I'm like, uh, you know, I cannot wait for you to have that room money so that you can can have your outfits and yeah. to see what you can do at that point but yeah this might not be the moment um but i've also <laughs> been just thrilled to see bimini yeah have so used that amazing. time yeah and to use that time in quarantine to really work on her outfits and to think about her looks and i'm 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 such a conceptual drag queen lover um i i'm so into concept queens and i think that's something i really appreciated about the uk season is a lot of concept queens and I think Gottmik is definitely a concept queen, and that's something I really appreciate about her work. Um, and also, as you said, that they're um, also uh, you know, creating their own path. They're a trailblazer as well, that they're um, really expanding who's um, in the drag community, right? Cause, um, and also really um, inviting other people to also come in, because I think that has been a big critique of RuPaul on that, yeah. you know, things... Yeah, that there's been some transphobia or weird ways that like Rue has been resistant to allowing um, other people of other genders to come in. And yeah. I think Gottmik is definitely saying bye <laughs> to all of that. And that's so exciting. And so. I'm also just obsessed with their work. I'm, yeah. I think that they're amazing. And yeah, so hope that they win. Um, yeah. But I also love Simone, too. I think Simone is so powerful. Can't overlook and Simone. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> Amazing. Would definitely could also see them winning as well. Well they've and got definitely that, they've got that like crazy confidence that is like kinda like Bob the Drag Queen esque levels of confidence <laughs> where they're just like going into everything like completely 
knowing that they are it. <laughs> and a concept queen too. That's something I love. They always come with incredible concepts for their looks and their 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 style and their aesthetic is amazing. They've had some iconic looks this season. So yeah, I could see it being a big fierce battle and I'm excited to see both of them battle <laughs> it out in the last. Um, I hope they have some anger to transmute and to, <laughs> and to work with for the finale. Yeah, and I think what's always stood out to me with Drag Race is like, I mean, like I said, I was kind of closeted and very pigeonholed within just the rugby community like all the people who I've met throughout the years have been rugby players and that's just kind of like the community that I've known I haven't had this like big LGBTQ community around me the community I had were usually just people that I was seeing at the time and I think that you know when I found Drag Race it was kind of a way where I was sort of welcomed into the community where it's like Mm. you can be a part of it in this way and have something to talk about with other people who are also queer and it's almost like a signal to other people when they see somebody like me who's like they would automatically assume is like a cis straight man is what a lot of people kind of assume when they would meet me to kind of then hear me be so excited about drag race and sharing my opinions is like another way that you can kind of signal to other people you know that you have these sort of commonalities between you and I've always just seen like a massive commonality not just between athletes and drag queens but athletes and artists in general is you know, there's very much painted as polar opposites, right? Where it's like, you know, artists are meant to be these like silent emotional types and athletes are meant to be boisterous and dumb and, you know, (laughs) strong and all those other things. But I think that a lot of the kind of intersections that are ignored is like artists tend to put everything aside for their craft at detriment to themselves and they will fully put themselves in it, not expecting any money out of it necessarily. If it comes, that's great but they will go all in on their craft just for the love of doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same is said about a lot of athletes and especially rugby athletes where there's not a lot of money in the sport. It's very much just about how much you love expressing yourself in that way and how much you love the game and being a player. And you'll make a lot of sacrifices that will um, be very detrimental in a lot of ways, but it's something you pursue because you're passionate about it. And I think that I saw that kind of comparison between athletes and drag queens especially because it's like you have drag race which is this show where you know 12 drag queens will get this big elevation of platform and financial opportunity but drag as a whole and as an art form is more about just people who are so passionate about expressing themselves in that way not expecting anything out of it other than just a space to be themselves definitely yeah and i think it's it's important to name that like as much as like capitalism might tell us that we're supposed to fit into a certain box so many of us are going to have passions and drives that are going to kick us out of those boxes yeah. and and so many of us feel like we have no other choice i know myself i've tried so much to be in that box and <laughs> and i feel like no matter what i've always had to create i've always had to be an artist as no matter how much i've been told that that wasn't going to be a viable option for me i've always had to do it and i think that is you know and i hear that in your story too right that you're someone that needed to that needs still to this day to kind of channel their energy through movement right yeah. and so i think that those are things to also let people know is that you might be like pigeonholed into a certain like path career path but that some of us don't have choices in terms of like (laughs) what we want to do and to and to allow yourself that you know if you if you're let's say because i've definitely worked a nine to five job right and there's still i've still had to find time to create because that's something that's always going to be there and to know that you know just like with rupaul just like with you know the way your career has um moved in and in the same way with my career it's like there can be moments that these passions can become really big parts of your life and actually transform your life and many times that's why we're also being given that message that there's something else wanting to happen is because there is many times like a path wanting to emerge for us and 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 i know how challenging it is to kind of um not listen to those voices that maybe tell you to not go down certain paths or to to be in that uncertainty of like I know this isn't making me money but I love doing this <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely and yeah I think that it just you know it gives you like you say a widened sort of what's possible and I think drag race is is great in showing that you know being true to yourself can pay off in that sort of a way yes definitely so I and that's a beautiful way to end this <laughs> you know being true to yourself can pay off 
it, it's so real and I'm so happy to see your honesty paying off for you and um, I definitely will be uh, leaving here in the description of this video some links to your website um, if you have anything to share in terms of like how people can contact you absolutely um you can always follow my Instagram at that gay rugger I've also got a Twitter and a Facebook with the same handle um, and then my website um, thatgayrugger.com I've got you know a lot of the media that I've been doing as well as some other projects that I'm working on you can kind of keep up with it there and hopefully moving forward you know I've got a few things I'm working on uh, op-ed around trans inclusion in sport and I'm hoping to kind oh, of yay. take on some other projects around that and around pushing back against the world rugby ban so yeah if you're interested in any of that those are where you can find me definitely wonderful so I'll make sure I link um those links to people and again thank you so much for your time it's been such a joy to connect and i i love how we, we went over so much um, of the time that we had allotted ourselves but this has just been such a wonderful conversation yeah it's okay it was uh it's to be expected it's a good thing i think if we <laughs> definitely <laughs> no, i really enjoyed it and thank you so much for having me yeah